It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 294 of Science on Top. Today is Monday, the 23rd of April, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Dr. Shane Joseph and Lucas Randall. Hey, we're recording on a Monday. We are. We've been mixing it up the last few weeks. We did Tuesday last week and Monday this week and probably back to Sunday next week. We're all over the shop. We are. I ain't promising anything. No, (laughs) we we make no promises here. (laughs) None. That's If you want promises, you're on the wrong show. This is not the show for promises. Although I can promise that on today's show, we'll be talking about the genes that are kind of taking over the oceans. We'll be talking about a new planet hunting spacecraft and the accidental enzyme that eats plastic. But first, you can help us make this show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. You get to choose your level of support that gets you different rewards We are really grateful to all the listeners who help us out each episode. Let's talk about the accidental enzyme that has been developed, I guess, uh, that eats plastic. This actually came through a study of an enzyme produced by a bacteria discovered in a Japanese waste uh, tip. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, Look, I think we talked about this when it first... um when it was first made public back in 2016. Um, so I remember yeah. reading about it at least. Yeah, so a Japanese group um, found this organism that which they called Ideonella sakaensis. Um, it's part of a well-known genus of um, well-known bacteria. But this one seems to have an enzyme which they dubbed PETAs for, you know, the plastic, um, mm-hmm. which I can't remember off the top of my head what it actually stands for. Oh, my God. Uh, polyethylene terephthalate. That'll do. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it breaks that down. Now, I'm guessing that this enzyme was not, did not evolve to break down plastics because plastics have actually only been around it in evolutionary terms for a minute yeah. um, geological time or e- evolutionary time frame. So I very much doubt that this enzyme evolved from scratch to break down plastics, but I'm guessing it so happened to have some sort of other natural substrate which so happens to also be amenable to breaking down plastics. Now, this is, this is actually quite important because plastics don't break down well. They can last years and years and years. And I think, I'm not sure what the, I can't, top of my head, I can't remember what the actual chemical basis of the breakdown is, but it's a very strong bond, probably something to do with the aromatic rings that's, that's in the benzene sort of mo- like molecules in plastic, which makes them essentially indestructible. Did you, did you say aromatic rings? Yeah. Aromatic. It sounds like something that would come out of the Ponds Institute. For, <laughs> is, <laughs> is that actually a thing, an aromatic yes, ring? Yes, it's actually a thing. Or, or, okay. I've, or I've simplified it too much. It's, they're basically um, hexagonal chemical rings that are like they're, they're very strong um, repeating units. And I think most, most like petrochemicals have them. And that's what, yeah, it's like the oil, it's a structure of oil. It's all the rest of it. Right. Okay. Cool. cool. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying, but. Oh, by all means. But, you know. So... And it's not aromatic as in the smell. Uh, right. That's what I'm ar- thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, I actually think it, from memory, I think it came about that because it has a certain smell. I have a funny feeling that's what the, the that's why it was coined that, but I could be wrong. Um, I, I, I'm going back to like you know, first year by first year chemistry here. I can't really remember off the top yeah. of my head. But anyway. it's just an organic chemistry term for uh, cyclical or ring shaped molecules. Yes. yes, yes. Anyway, so this enzyme breaks those things down, and it doesn't break it down particularly efficiently. Like it takes um, a thin film of PET plastic it takes about I think twenty hours or something to get broken down. So think of a thin film like sort of a couple of microns across. And then think about how much plastic gets dumped into the ocean every year. Um, and th- there's a figure that's quoted in this new article, which says that uh, like one, I think one million plastic bottles are sold every minute or something like that. Which oh is my geez. something something crazy like that. It's, uh, so so this, this, the sheer scale of this is insane. 
and that's just and that's based on what we know about the wild type or the original enzyme on in this organism. Now, what these this article says that they you know they accidentally made this. No, they didn't accidentally make this. They were looking at the enzyme, they were tweaking it. They just wanted to see how it worked, and I think they did it. They they, they took the gene and they tweaked it a bit, and they found that they'd increased its efficiency by twenty percent, which is good. Like, and they they call that modest. That's not modest. That's actually you know a fair. A fair Significant increase. Yeah. It's a pretty big margin. That being said, it's still when you look at the scale of the plastics that are in being dumped in the world and that are still being made, it's still not great. I mean, we're not going to solve the world's plastic problem by dumping this organism into the oceans just yet, or or even a um, you know, like a, a modified version of it. But it's it it gives us a bit of hope because it means that we can tweak the enzyme and we can make it more efficient. Um. Now, there's no paper for this new tweaking as such. I can't find one anyway. So it's just, I think, I'm guessing it's just a press release that's been released through outlets like The Guardian. But um, they have they bring up some interesting ideas. Now, The Guardian, I really like The Guardian because they're one of the few outlets that don't screw things up too much. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, so Guardian, if you're listening to us, you know, we... um Hat tip. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know we would appreciate some kudos back. Anyway, yeah, uh, <laughs> that'll but, happen. Yeah, I know. Anyway, um, what's what's good about this is that first of all, because um, it's been found in a bacterium. Now, similar similar genes have been found in fungi. Um, in pre, in, uh, I think quite a long time ago. But the problem is that using fungi as like a bioremediation tool is extremely hard because growing fungi in large scale industrial quantities is is, is just it's horrible because think about how the fungi grow and the spores and the hyphae and you know the tangling up in the reactors it would just not work whereas bacteria because they're single cells you can pump them out and dilute them pump them out again and get a large titer so it's it's an idea another idea they've thought of is well how do we take the gene for this petas that we've modified and put it into a so-called extremophile bacterium something that can grow at say 70 degrees at which state plastic becomes a lot more viscous and therefore probably a lot more amenable to being broken down. So we can use it that way. Um, but essentially the, possi- the possibilities aren't endless, but they are definitely scalable and there's focus for the future. So, yeah. Yeah. I do quite like this. That's a promising sort of uh, avenue to go down. Uh, I just wanted to clarify this is based on a paper published in the Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, okay. Is there anything else that we need to say on that? It was just no. Plastics bad. Bacteria good. Let's leave it. <laughs> Two legs. Uh, what? No. <laughs> I can't. I'm, I must admit, I kind of when you were saying, you know, it's not a matter of just dumping this into the ocean. I was thinking, imagine if we did though, and they've gone. Plastic is so yummy, but oh my god, we never got a taste of coral before. How <laughs> yummy is that? Well, actually, funny you should mention that. I think like a lot of these so-called golden bullet ideas, you know, we could be creating another entire problem that we haven't even foreseen yet if we do right. something. I'm thinking like cane toad sort of situation, yeah. you know. I, I was going to suggest that, you know, once we then use this enzyme, we flood the oceans with it to uh, eat all the plastic, we'll then need to develop an enzyme-eating enzyme that can then get rid of yeah. that enzyme. Right. And it's Yeah. I'm just imagining all those people in plastic boats, like kayaks, all of a sudden, I'm disappearing around them. Goddamn enzymes! I'm sinking. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. Well, we are all looking forward to the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. But last month, NASA announced another delay in the schedule and said that new scope won't be ready to launch until May 2020. But just last week, SpaceX successfully launched NASA's replacement for the Kepler planet-hunting spacecraft. Lucas, tell us all about TESS. Yeah, so so TESS, TESS. I love it when they make it easy. <laughs> Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. I mean, it's just one of those. Where often I kind of take the piss, to be honest, of <laughs> NASA names for things because it's like, how can we retrofit some words into yeah. this acronym to make it sort of sound like a thing. And and they always kind of want to make it so that it's sayable as a word, right? You know, you can't just have the acronym, you know, T-S-S-T-M-S, 
You know, you can't say that. That's not the <laughs> word. So they go, T, we need, we need a vowel. What are we going to use? Exoplanet. Perfect. But, That's a but need. at the same time, you don't need to have an acronym or anything because we didn't with Kepler or James Webb's Herschel. We just give it a name. Th- that's true. That rolls off the But they're, they're a little bit different. Yeah, because they're they're people that we're honouring, right? So that's that's okay. Mm-hmm. We don't want to shorten the people because then you're Who's little Tess people. that we're honouring? <laughs> <clears throat> I'm sure there's been lots of Tesses involved with various things that are that are important. But anyway, we digress. Tess, yes. transiting exoplanet survey satellite. So this is a nice cool little mission. Uh, and I, to be honest, hadn't read much about this one because it was not really sort of on on my radar because I, I've been, I, I, I like Kepler. We've covered Kepler a lot <laughs> on this show. We've done a lot of stories about how, I mean, it, for, for a spacecraft that had some issues and, and you know, we love this whole thing of how incredibly versatile and, and, and cool NASA and JPL can be about solving problems and getting stuff just working when they're, when they're broken. And Kepler sort of had a few issues with its, um, with its, with its gyros and so forth. But Tess sounds pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Tess kind of picks up where, where Kepler uh, leaves off. And Kepler's still doing its K2 mission. It's still... But it's starting to lose its. I mean, we covered it recently. It's starting to lose its uh, its ability to point at stuff, um, which I already solved once. But now it's kind of like it's like the old guy, you know, in the in the cafe that's just kind of looking all around, and you're just like, is he is he looking at me? I don't know. I can't tell if he's wow. look, he's not looking at me. He's looking straight past me. Now I realise he he's not even seeing anything. That's kind of where Kepler's at now. <laughs> but but Tess, <laughs> Tess. This is, is going to look oh, God. Fairly- You're rivaling the Guardian for your ability to break things down <laughs> to ideas we can all get behind. Yeah, right. The pervy old man in the cafe. Great. <laughs> I, so you made him pervy. I didn't say he was pervy. I never went there. You've made him pervy. I, 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 think, I, think, you imp- I think you implied that he was I, pervy. No, you inferred that from what I said. This is your all constant right. problem you're having tonight. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so he's not pervy for the record. He's just old. All right, can we just lay off with the age? <laughs> Who is this guy? Do you know <laughs> him? Matter. Can we move past <laughs> This is a metaphor. We've used it up. It's gone. Let's, let's move on. So, all right, Kepler... Is dying. Right. Kepler's dying. But Ke- Kepler was designed to look at a, n- a very narrow piece of sky. It basically was just, it was meant to just fix its gaze upon this part of the sky and it will go, okay, how many exoplanets can I see here? And it was basically just using that transit method that we've discussed many times. So I won't go into how it works. So that was what it was looking for. TESS is a little bit different. So TESS is going to be scanning, catch this. 80%, 85% of the sky, 85% of the freaking sky. So this is, <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is going to be looking at specifically. It's going to be looking for bright stars. So it's going to be looking at roughly two hundred thousand ish, uh, or so of the the brighter stars in in the sky. And the reason that's going for bright stars is because it just gives us so much more information, and it means that we can follow it up with ground based observations, which is important. If you do it with ground base, it means you're not using this one instrument to do all of the work. So it's going to be looking at these bright uh, stars. It's going to be measuring the brightness and it's going to be looking for transits. So that's similar to what Kepler was doing, but it's going to be simultaneously looking at a massive swathe of sky. Uh, and then coming back with with those um, with those candidates, and of course, as we already know, with the transit method, you need follow up. Obviously, you need to see it happen really three times to say, "Yep, bang, that is a transit." Because I now know what the orbital period of the thing is. I've seen the same dip in this uh, star's brightness in a re- in a repeatable period. But then there's also, you know, you can get other complicating factors where three is not enough. You might have, for example, an alignment of planets. So the first two goes around, maybe you see this this planet that's quite close to the star will be transiting and dropping the brightness of the star by the same percentage each time. But then the third time around, it might just happen to align with another larger planet that's further out in the orbit. And then, of course, well, that screws up your data. So now you've got to wait for a fourth go around because then that hopefully will be by itself again. So, you know, it can be it, it can take some time to do this stuff, which is why Kepler, you know, with, with the, the, the thousands of, of, uh, of com- confirmed planets that it's found, there are as many again that are just um, uh, uh, candidates and we need to we need to see them do their do their little dance again. 
the way that this is going to work and looking at these bright stars, it means that we can use other instruments to do follow up. And the other cool thing about using bright stars is with those other instruments, when you've got enough light, you can collect spectra. And once you have spectra, you get a lot more information. This is when you can say, OK, not only do I know the orbital period, the orbital period helps me figure out um, some factors such as, OK, it goes around the star, it blocks out this much light, it has this orbital period, we can start to get to the, um, uh, the mass of the, uh, of the object. But we can also, using spectra, uh, sorry, get to the, uh, the, the size of the object, I should say, not the mass. But using spectra, we can start to get the mass because then we can use that Doppler shift method as well. Because remember, when you've got a star in the middle, if you can just imagine a star on a two-dimensional plane, if you hold your finger out in front of you, and then if you hold your other hand and you go around that star as though you've got a planet going around that star, right? Are you doing that? Are you all doing that yep. right now? Yeah. Yep. yep. So as your as your 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 left hand in my case is or your your left hand in my case, my left hand in my case <laughs> is going around my star. What it does is it slightly tugs on that star. So it brings the star for a little a little journey around with it. And the commonly used scenario is the the shot putter. You know how they, they'll spin around and they'll throw the shot. And and it kind of the 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 weight of this thing, you know, or the mass of this thing is basically tugging them around in the in the spot. So they're not just in one spot. So that process is causing the star to wobble. So uh, so that wobble then is detectable as a Doppler shift. And of course this is when the wavelength of light changes it shortens as it get as it gets pulled towards us and it and it gets longer as it pulls away so as it comes towards us it seems to get bluer as it goes away from us it seems to get a little bit redder and if you've got a bright star that spectra is so much easier to get and then you can make those measurements much much better and then you've got two pieces of the puzzle you've got the mass and you've got the size and the mass and the size with the orbital period all of those things together mean that you can work out the density so you can say, what type of planet is this? Is this a rocky planet? Is this a, uh, a planet with a large atmosphere? Is it a gaseous planet? Is it an ice giant? Those sorts of things. So all of that stuff is really, really cool because at the moment, all we can tell about most of the planets that we found out there are they're likely to be, based on the the uh, the transit of their, their star, they're likely to be like a super Jupiter or they're likely to be this sort of thing or they're really close into their star because the orbital period tells us that. But it, unfortunately, we don't know what type. We're, we're, we're inferring that they're probably a rocky um, a planet because of, of uh, how close to the star that they are. But they could also just as equally be a, a Jupiter that's really close to the star that's whizzing around really, really fast. You know, there's, we don't know. It's harder to get to that without the spectra. So that's really where this this all sort of comes together is, is this new instrument allows us to, to use multiple uh, you know, to, to do follow-ups with other instruments, which means we don't necessarily have to be watching the same, you know, piece of sky with, with uh, TESS all of the time. But also we can get more information, including does it have an atmosphere? If it does have, a, have an atmosphere, what is it? it? Once again, if we're collecting spectra, we can start to see, remember the absorption, spectra abs absorption lines that we've talked about before, they can, they can tell us by the abs or by black lines appearing in the spectra, we can see, for example, at this wavelength, we know this is an absorption line indicating oxygen. So that planet, which is a rocky planet that has an orbital period of X, which is inside that planet's Goldilocks zone, means that this rocky planet probably has an atmosphere that contains oxygen. That's really interesting because usually on Earth, Oxygen is linked to life. So it's life that's creating the oxygen. So you know what I mean? There's a lot more that we can get, um, you know, with the instrument because of, of, of its design and the fact they're concentrating on these brighter stars. The other thing that was interesting about this is its orbit. And I didn't know anything about the orbit until I read the excellent Bad Astronomy blog that we've mentioned many, many times by Phil Plate. It's funny, I didn't even realize I was reading Bad Astronomy because Ed sends us these links and goes, here are some signs for you to digest for the show. And we, we dutifully, uh, and long in advance of the night of the recording, obviously, we'll sit down and read these stories, and we will, we will make our, our suggestions of what we would like to discuss, and sometimes we bring stories with us. I don't always pay attention to what I'm reading. When I trust Ed. He sends me reputable things. And when I'm reading this one, I'm, I'm like two-thirds of the way through the story going, man, this is such a well-written well story. I'm really getting this. And what a great description. This sounds like something Phil Plate would write. 
and I scroll up and it was Phil Blight. So there you go, Phil. I know the way you write. I can tell your your voice just from reading you. But anyway, um, what what Phil? And I do recommend because I can't cover it in anywhere near as as concise and and beautiful detail as he has. But he described the orbital path of this of this craft, and it's really cool. I didn't know anything about this until I read. Redfield's blog. So basically, in just really concise summary of what's going on, it's on a it's on a path. It's on a, it's in an orbit around Earth that has never been used before. In fact, this orbit was only discovered a few years ago. This 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 orbit that was theorised a few years ago that it that it could work, that it could be a stable orbit. So it's on quite a an elongated orbit. So it has it it does travel quite a, a far on its on its perigee and its apogee there's a big there's a big difference so its closest uh, approach to earth and its furthest approach a uh, furthest distance from earth uh, uh, there's quite a big difference but it's also on a on a on a really bizarre angle it's on this 37 degree angle of uh, of orbit and the reason for mm. this is because of the moon <laughs> you want more mm. detail don't you so the moon i think so, is yeah. getting, because it's because <laughs> it's going around the earth and it's on this crazy sort of elliptical orbit it's going to get perturbed by the gravity of the moon because that's the kind of scale that we're talking about now. So if you imagine that the moon uh, is sitting out on its on its thing, and and in because of this um, this angle that it's on, the moon's apparently always ninety percent around its own orbit, away from Tess because of the timing. Now that's fine, but it's still going to have an impact because you if you imagine the Earth and the moon are a common system of gravity, there they have. A, a common center of gravity, the barycenter of that gravitational system is inside Earth, yes, but it's not at the center of Earth. So as a result, you've got something that's going around Earth. The whole system is kind of wobbling a little bit because of this 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 tug of war that's going on between Earth and the Moon. So um, so that's going to affect Tess. So what they do is they put it at this crazy weird angle, so that and and they time it as such by having this orbit at this this size, so that. At one half of the month, so when I say month, I'm talking about specifically the lunar uh, period. In one half of the lunar period, the moon is on the opposite side. And then as Tess comes around the other way, the moon's on the opposite side then. And because the moon has switched positions, they've kind of gone like a do si do around the Earth, right? They're kind of spinning so around. It cancels out. It cancels out. How cool is that? So they're actually using huh. the moon to cancel the moon. I love that. That is so cool. <laughs> how 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 long was this um in development for this whole this project? Six. I don't know. I made that up. I have no idea. Let, uh, uh, no. I don't know about the actual project, but the that orbit itself was first proposed in twenty thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because because I can imagine that would have taken some really head screwy mathematics and calculations. I love that stuff that. so much. I swear to God, <laughs> we've talked about orbital mechanics before, and I, I just. I think it is the coolest thing. My my head hurts just thinking about that simplified explanation. I have so I, I slaughtered that, but... Phil Plate's explanation. Like I have taken it and I've I've slashed it and burned it and and really just right. done a terrible job. But my point is, yeah. it's really really cool. It's it's it's, it's cool. Yes, yeah, it's and, it's and you need to go and read it if you've not read it because it's like I'm I'm we going will. oh my god when I'm reading this thing. It's so cool. We will, of course, have a link to Phil Plate's Bad Astronomy blog in the show notes. Shane, we've talked before about retrotransposons, these genes that jump from one organism to another. I think we talked last year about how a quarter of cow DNA actually comes from reptiles. But these retrotransposons are really fascinating things, and they're turning up more and more these days, especially in marine animals like fish and clams and all shellfish really what's going on here yeah um this is a sort of interesting case um so back in the 1970s these scientists noticed that a lot of their shellfish were dying from what looked like le leukemia which was essentially like the, the blood of them of these um mollusks and stuff turning white and clogging the organs and dying off and it was quite um tenacious and it wasn't it didn't seem to go away and they could not figure out what the hell it was um, so they're looking for things like viruses, and they couldn't find anything. Now, recently, this this group has found that yeah, it's probably as 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 Ed said, um, a retro transposon element, which is basically like a little DNA that just seems to jump from genome to genome, and sometimes is fairly benign, doesn't do much, 
Um, I think you'll look at, if you look at the human genome, I think we are very largely composed of either active or inactive transposons or transposable elements. Um, if, you, if you read something like The Selfish Gene, which um, is a very elegant book by Richard Dawkins, probably one of his only elegant books, um, you'll find that, <laughs> sorry, did I say that out loud? Um, you'll find that um, he explains this theory of this, basically this stretch of DNA that, or a genetic element that exists for no other reason apart from to maintain itself. And that has led in a lot of ways to the evolutionary path that we have seen. Um, in some cases, this confers advantages. In some cases, it causes, it runs a mark, but that leads to evolutionary pressure, uh, sorry, selection pressure, and evolution goes along its merry way. Um, and in this case, it seems to have infected not just shellfish, but lots of other aquatic animals too. And not just the way we would normally think of like vertical transmission, which is, you know, from mother to offspring, et cetera, but across species. So if you look at um, things like, if you, if you look at like the genetic diversity of even different mollusks, they're quite diverse. And you, if you say you look from, say, this state of Maine to like some shellfish you'll find in Antarctica, 67% of their genes are identical, except for the transposable elements, which are something like 90% identical, which is kind of crazy. Actually, 97% identical is the, is the figure. It's, it's, it says that somehow these transposable elements are moving across vast distances, across species. And they, and they found them in things like zebrafish too, which are not related to shellfish mm. by any stretch of the imagination. So they, these things can jump from genome to genome. And we don't know if they're causing problems in other organisms. They, mm. they are obviously causing problems in shellfish, but maybe they're just benign elements in um, other uh, organisms. Now, they're not, they're not being transferred to like, say, you know, from a fish to say um, a land-dwelling mammal. And that has been known to happen in some cases, or not that specific case, but there has been known to be ancient tr transposable um, <clears throat> elements have jumped from, you know, like avian populations to bird, uh, to humans, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's not very common, whereas this, is, this seems to be almost ubiquitous. Hmm. Um, and the question is, how are they getting there? Now, it's like, you know, what, one idea is, you know, well, they're somehow being packed, but there's no genes on this transposable would allow them to package their own DNA into a movable um, vessel like a viral particle. So that's, not, that's probably not it. Um, it could be a parasite, a, a marine parasite, but they're not very well understood. So it's quite feasible that there is some sort of marine parasite that we don't know about that's transferring them. But you've got to think that these things are also moving across vast distances mm. and in massively different like water temperatures, and so, et cetera. So... It's a bit of a mystery. I'm almost expecting um, you to say, and we've just found that there's quantum entanglement involved. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it does kind of sound a bit it like does. that, you know, two completely yeah, different yeah. ends of the world. And yeah, it's just weird. Um, it's, it, it's a family of these retro elements called STEMA. And, yeah, there's, and STEMA seems to be quite good at moving between different aquatic animals. It's sort of another little um, interesting kind of, I don't know, like a, a piece of the puzzle in terms of how genetic elements move and how they have driven evolution um, and how they even just sort of do their thing, which we don't think about very often. Like we think, I, I think we, when, when, we, when we're taught evolutionary biology in school, we're taught in sort of very linear fashion. And that's, how it's, that's the only way to make sense of it. Like you can't just chuck all this stuff at students at once and get it because it's just, it's impossible. So, we, you know, we learn from, you know, selection pressure leads to, you know, well, sorry, mutation in genes, that are random will then lead to either, you know, these genes being selected because they're advantageous or being deleted because they're, dis because they're not advantageous. Mm -hmm. And that's how things move. But then you, you bring in something like this, which is just a total spanner in the works, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> and, that can, and that can drive evolution in a quite much faster way in some ways because, you know, you disrupt genes or you confer advantages that are all of a sudden extremely advantageous. And it just depends where they go. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm also, what's interesting about this is that I think they have, um, from what I've inferred from this article, is that these elements don't just sort of randomly insert themselves into the different genomes. They insert themselves into very particular parts, which makes sense, I guess, because they'll, they're, I guess they probably look for elements that they can sort of splice into. They wouldn't just splice into any random part of a genome. So it is, it is quite a specific way of doing it, but in some cases this has major deleterious effects on, on its host organism.
Mm. And in other cases, not at all. So I kind of get yeah. the for some reason my gut is telling me these are going to be really important for some reason. Yeah. Well, they already are because I think we're seeing these um that they even talk about them being contagious cancers. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's and, right. and so the Tasmanian devils, for example, their facial tumor is a, a related to these tran- retro transposons. Mm. So I'm wondering how long it will be, you know, given that they don't know how it's how it's moving around, how long it will be before we find it in, say, seabirds that eat fish? Yeah, possibly. Mm. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, would not, not surprise possible. me. In fact, I'm not even sure if they've looked there, to be honest. Mm. I mean, I'm not sure if you can – I'm not sure how well the, a transposable element would be transferred through, like, the, you know, the fecal oral route, but – who knows? We don't know. Yeah, I mean, it says in this article that stemma genes only seem to jump between aquatic animals. It's not in birds or mammals, insects, yeah. or spiders, which suggests that it's moving through water. That, they, that they've looked at, right? I mean, yeah, there's probably know. a whole lot of birds. <laughs> Have they sampled all the birds? No. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, very interesting one to keep an eye on, definitely. Yeah. And I think that's our show. As always, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 294. And if you like, you can tweet about us, post about us on Facebook, let your friends know about the show and why it is you like it. And, of course, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Shane and Lucas. No worries, mate. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Do you understand? Some people think that securing current industries and their jobs is more urgent than transforming our economies to meet the global challenge of climate change. I hear, I hear these concerns. But we must find a smooth transition to a low-carbon economy. Because what is the meaning of our life, really, if we work and live destroying the planet while sacrificing the future of our children? What is the meaning of our life if our decision, our conscious decision, is to reduce the opportunities for our children or grandchildren? by polluting the oceans, not mitigating CO2 emissions, and destroying our biodiversity, we are killing our planet. Let us face it. There is no planet B.